I'm Dr. Adrian Battle, Superintendent of Metro Nashville Public Schools and the first black woman to lead our district serving more than 80,000 students. These are challenging times for black women superintendents. We see political forces attacking students who look like we do by refusing to acknowledge the truths of history and undermining our push for greater equity for all students and all families. And we know that there aren't as many of us as there should be that the ranks of superintendents across our country need to be more diverse to reflect the student populations that we serve. So we need to be more diligent and vigilant about bringing more black women into leadership roles in our districts, pulling them up when they've earned promotions and helping them advance their careers. We must always remember to reach back, extend a hand, open doors, and be mentors to those coming along behind us. Despite the challenges, I also see great opportunities to serve our students and strengthen our communities, as public schools have always done. Public schools are the engine room of democracy. Our schools bring diverse groups of students together and help them learn to work with each other by seeing beyond color, class, and background. In Metro Nashville Public Schools, our mantra is every student known. We work hard every day to make sure every student is known, valued, supported, cared for, and on a path to success. We learn what our students are good at, what their interests are, and what makes them unique. And we do everything we can to help each child learn, grow, and thrive. We have to be especially intentional about serving students of color and giving them pathways to success. It can be difficult to believe in the 21st century, but we still have many political leaders working overtime to rewrite history and downplay the impact that racism has had on our society. What they dismiss as woke, I call wise. And we all have to lead by using the wisdom we've learned through the centuries to give our black and brown students both the education and the social emotional supports they need to succeed. Identifying and eliminating inequities is a core tenet for our district. And we will continue that work with passion, intention, and sound strategic thinking. Our students deserve nothing less from us. Leadership is never easy, but it is always essential. These times demand strong leadership and black women superintendents have what it takes to provide that leadership and to help our students, our families, our districts, and our communities achieve the dreams they deserve. Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Robin Harris. I am the Vice President of Communications at the Education Trust. The Education Trust team has been anxiously awaiting this day, the chance to have an important and much needed conversation about how black women superintendents across the country are leading <coughs> with excellence. I wanna start with a few thank yous. I know we usually keep thank yous to the end, but since it's Teacher Appreciation Week, I think it's most fitting that we give our thank yous now. I wanna thank AASA, the School Superintendents Association for co-hosting this event with us. I wanna thank the Wallace Foundation. This event is supported in part by the Wallace Foundation. I wanna thank our collaborators. These are like-minded organizations that helped us spread the word and secure, I think, over 800 registrants today. You can receive them on our event webpage, but I want to name them. Education Leaders of Color, Campaign for Our Shared Future, Center for Black Educator Development, Donors Choose, National Association of Black School Educators, Council of the Great City Schools, TNTP, and the Black Teacher Collaborative. Finally, I really wanna thank all the Black women educators and leaders, including my mother, who is a retired public school teacher in Gary, Indiana, for serving daily in classrooms, in schools, in districts, in states at the federal level, just ensuring that every kid has what they need to thrive. You just heard from one of our leaders, Dr. Adrian Battle. She's just one of the many that you will hear from today. I also, in planning, want to point out, we wanted to really emphasize the importance of community. We know that it takes a village. So we have in our room in the audience today, a village of experts and supporters, former district leaders, aspiring district leaders, higher education leaders and researchers, and really just a room full of fierce advocates for education equity. I wanna thank you all for joining us too. 
The importance of teachers and principals has been well documented in how they affect student outcomes. Teachers are the number one predictor of student success in the classroom. And research also shows the power of a black teacher. Just having one black teacher in elementary school increases the likelihood of a black student graduating from high school and aspiring to college. The Wallace Foundation has done decades of research to document the importance of principles on student achievement. And also principles of color have a positive impact on both students and teachers of color. So it's not a stretch to imagine the influence of district leaders and particularly black women district leaders. They currently are only 1.4% of those leading the nation across the leading districts across the nation. But in today's political environment, where cultural and political conflict are inside our classrooms, the question is, who would not be better to lead? Black women have know how to thrive amid racism and sexism, overcoming systemic barriers and challenges that their peers just don't endure. How can we get more to the superintendent level and what can we do to support them when they get there? That's our topic for tonight. Uh, we have an exciting panel set up for you. Um, we're going to start with a conversation between Denisa Superville. She is assistant editor at Education Week and Dr. Angel Miles Nash, program officer at the Wallace Foundation. Denisa writes extensively about school leaders and principals. She also um, public, is co-editor of the Learning from Leaders series at Education Week. Uh, Angel, before she got to the Wallace Foundation, was assistant professor at Chapman University. And her research focuses on the intersectionality of black women's leadership. So I will turn it over to Denisa and Angel. Thank you, Robin. And thank you for the invitation. Um, thanks to everyone who's joining us online to dive into research on this really <coughs> important topic, but one that doesn't get enough attention. Um, so Dr. Nash, um, I was reviewing some of your recent research on female superintendent. Robin referenced this number, but it also struck me that 3.5% of superintend female su of superintendents, sorry, women of color, and that's there's an even smaller percentage that are black women. Um, what needs to happen, do you think, to make people sit up and wonder why is that the case and what can be done about it? Thank you for the question, Denise. It's a very important one and one we've spent a lot of time looking into. And to understand why there are less at that level, at the leadership level, we wanted to first take a step back and look at what the superintendency comes from, which is the classroom. So at the classroom level, black women occupy seven and a half percent of the teacher population. And then when they move to the principalship, their first foray or step into leadership at the school site level, they're 7%. So that's not so bad of a drop off, but to then see that number over time go to 1.4%, as Robin mentioned, is a drastic change that we have to pay super close attention to, especially when we recognize that 15% of the public school population is black students. So recognizing the benefits that black students experience when they have black teachers and leaders in place makes us sit up and pay attention to what we need to do to fix that mismatch in numbers. The American Association of School Administrators, or AASA, offered us the opportunity through their decennial report that they do every 10 years. For the first time in that decennial report in 2020, the data that they gave us to work with was disaggregated by race and by gender. And so that gave us an opportunity to unpack and really zoom in on what was happening at the superintendent level for black women specifically before those numbers weren't parsed out. And so we could see what they were experiencing at a granular level on the quantitative side of things that help us fill in the gaps about why they were not represented as highly because they were being underserved on their way up to the district level leadership. And so when we recognize from the 1,200 respondents of that survey and seeing that only 18 
identified as black women, we recognize that we have to unpack the numbers and see what they're experiencing and then use that to sound the alarm for those who are able to put those black women in place, starting from that classroom position. The benefits that Robin alluded to, including the benefits of having a black teacher for the first time offering more opportunity to access to higher education and technical education, starts in the classroom where black students are doing better when they have at least one black teacher. They're also doing better in being placed in gifted education when they have a black teacher. And so black teachers are staying in place when they have a black principal because black principals are more likely to hire and retain black teachers. So thinking about the benefits makes us stand up and pay attention and decide what can we do? Because when we see the benefits ahead of time from our research, we realize we need to fill in the gaps and do more about it. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about what they bring to the table. What do black women superintendents bring to the table? How do their lived experiences and their professional experiences inform the work that they do? So black women, in addition to the technical word or je ne sais quoi <laughs> they bring to the table, bring an expertise in curriculum and instruction leadership because our research shows they spend more time in the classroom than many of their peers. It takes them longer to, to ascend to the superintendency. But they're also finding through the research that the things that they spend more of their time on, the issues include financial uh, stewardship of their district, the communications, the community engagement they have with parents and families in their communities, and also the board relationships that they form. And all of those stakeholders that I mentioned point to the fact that black women are able to build trust. And that speaks to the way that they have to walk through the world and what informs their experiences and then how they use those to inform their leadership through what I call intersectional leadership because they are at the intersection of race and gender when it comes to their understanding and the lens that they use to see what's going on around them and make important decisions on behalf of the children who look like them and those across their districts who may not look like them, but of course they still have them in their heart and their minds when they're leading with their hands. And that we found makes it such that black women are more likely to be placed in districts that have over 51% of students of color. They're also more likely to be placed in districts that have lower, higher occurrences of lower SES. And they also are more likely to be placed in districts where they are able to build stronger community relations. They felt that they have strong, stronger community relations. So again, the experiences they, they have in their personal life and their own preparation helps them determine how they will lead from the intersection. It seems like the moment that we're facing right now in the country and in K-12 kind of calls for more black women to step into those roles. Absolutely, because black women also reported in their survey results that they find, 90% of them find it more that they were better prepared, they said, and specifically sufficiently or best prepared to talk about race and issues of inclusiveness and other issues that are important to them. And 90% found that it was extremely important for them to be able to do so. So because they, are, as you mentioned, this moment in time are prepared to have those conversations, they become a model for other leaders to learn from. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, retention because it's not just always about getting people in the door, but getting them to stay there. And uh, during Women, Women's History Month, we talked to a number of superintendents, some of them black women, about what it took to get the job and what are some of the supports that got them to stay. And what I heard from them was that districts weren't always ready to support them because they're often the first, either the first woman or the first black woman. And you sort of don't know what you don't know. It's not to blame the districts um, because you haven't had to deal with that before. Um, but a couple of things came up. Um, a couple of things they mentioned that helped them was things like building in targeted professional development into contracts, setting up targeted mentoring support. And I'm curious about what recommendations you may have for districts that are looking to hire black women superintendent to get them to stay and feel supported once they're on the job. 
several. Thanks for asking. <laughs> so <laughs> I could go on for a while, but I'll keep it short. Um, so first, because we recognize that many of our superintendents, black women superintendents, were former principals, we have a lot to learn from the research, the extensive research that we've done at the Wallace Foundation and scholars across the academy have done around the principalship to learn and apply that to the superintendency. So that includes our learning about how we can build comprehensive pathways or uh, to leadership that include alignment between state education agencies, between school districts, professional development opportunities, and between the university principal preparation programs. So we've invested a lot of years and funds into making sure that we understand how they work best. And we found great results that are available on the Wallace Knowledge Center on our, our website to share how you can build a strong and sustainable pathway to leadership. So I recommend taking the lessons that we've learned from the principalship and applying them and trying them out on the superintendency. I also feel like it's extremely important to provide femtoring opportunities for black women, spaces for them to get together across the state from their districts, uh, both at the superintendent level and for those who are aspiring to the superintendency so that they can talk about what they're experiencing, learn from each other. Femtoring has played an amazing role in my work and my sustainability and longevity in continuing this work, recognizing their successes, but there's certainly also challenges around focusing in on the excellence that is black women's leadership. And so being being able to provide networks of opportunity for them, being intentional from the district perspective and the state level perspective to provide spaces for them to safely discuss. Superintendents have often mentioned that they need a listening ear outside of their district to be a sounding board and providing mm -hmm. those spaces intentionally would be an excellent great step because as I mentioned, femtors have changed my uh, way of looking about the resilience that can happen. Many of my femtors are in this room and I wouldn't be here still standing strong for what black women have and what they need if I didn't have them around. So providing that for superintendents is extremely important to make sure that we increase that 1.4%. Mentoring and networking were two things that came up in every single conversation that we had with women for that series. So thank you again for you know, elevating the importance of that. Um, you know, when we started as we talked about, this is not an area that's covered a lot, doesn't get enough focus. As someone who, you know, is training their eyes on this, I'm curious about what are the questions you have what are the research areas? What are the questions you have about this? And what you'd like to see researchers dig into as they look at, look at black women in the superintendency? Absolutely. So the questions, as they say, as researchers, that keep you up at night, <laughs> um, they keep you going. And the one question that um, started me on this journey that kept me up at night was when I had a black boy student under the age of 10 who was told by uh, one of my colleagues, an administrator, that just the way he walked into the room could be seen as a threat. And when I pushed back gently to say that that was wholly inappropriate and that we instead needed to circle around all of our children, but especially understanding the historicity of challenges and oppression that informed his life, those he knew about and those he didn't, that's what pushed me into this research. And so I continue to still ask those questions because I recognize that my upbringing, my K-12 experience included black women who would have known better than to say that to uh, any child, but certainly a black boy or a black child. And so that is why I chased the understanding of the Je ne sais quoi, because I recognize that the model that black women have served in the superintendency and in leadership and in the classroom needed to be shared with more people. And so I had to go back to school and learn about how to create or bottle up, if you will, crystallize the excellence that they were demonstrating and share it with others. So that took deep you know, diving, years of, of, of research that continues on to this day. So that very question still remains. That was 10 years ago. So I'm still asking, I still encourage others to ask similar questions that they can answer through qualitative and quantitative research around this. A brighter light needs to be shine, sh shine on the excellence that is black women. And I also want to understand specifically how they are able to operationalize what I've written about the intersectional leadership and operationalize their success. 
we can't just stand back and applaud them and not dig into what they're doing so well. Some of our work and commitment at the Wallace Foundation to what we call the Equity Center Pipeline Initiative specifically focuses on that through our research of what is happening at the district level for the eight districts that we are funding right now. So we're taking a particularly interesting look at how they are able to do what they do and operationalize equity over five years. It should not be something that pops into your district and then pops out, you should stay, you know, and so you should really invest um, through research. I also think we need to understand from a research perspective how black women, fem or other black women, because again, the magic that is happening in those circles when it does lead to success is something we need to capture and share with everyone who will listen. Well, I personally look forward to your research in this area as a reporter and as someone who's deeply invested in seeing this work happen. And I think we may get some answers to some of those questions <laughs> later on the panel. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Nash. You, Thank you, Denise. Thank you both so much. Great, thank you. Um, we have learned so much from the questions that you both have asked. Angel as a researcher and Denisa as a journalist, interviewing, asking those questions and coming to this work from your own personal experiences. I just wanna appreciate that. I do wanna ask, we are honored to have uh, Kamaya Marshall share welcoming remarks. He's gonna come on up to the podium. He serves as a senior advisor to Secretary Miguel Cordona and to the Office of Communications and Outreach at the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you, welcome. Hello everybody, I'm glad to be here. I have these remarks, but I'm wondering should I actually read them? I think I'm gonna read them. But <laughs> one, thank you, because this is a timely discussion. Um, greetings, I'm Kamari Marshall, as she's mentioned. I bring greetings from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, under the leadership of Secretary Miguel Cardona, our Deputy Secretary, Cindy Martin, and our Chief of Staff, Sheila Nix. First, a special thank you to the entire team at the Ed Trust for allowing me to bring remarks for this timely discussion um, where everyone will get to hear from these amazing superintendents who happen to be black women in leadership, raising the bar, leading the world. At the Department of Education, we talk about raising the bar Raising the bar for mental health access, improved reading and math in K-12, better college and career pathways, raising the bar for lifting and teaching profession, raising the bar for college affordability and return on investments. This is a moment of truth in education. And thanks to the American Rescue Plan, there's more money in education than ever. I want you all to know that it's more money in education than ever. It's a down payment on transformational change in education. Now is the time to transform how we invest in mental health, include students with disabilities, build career connected pathways for all of our students. And now is the time to transform how we recruit, retain, and support our teachers, including black educators. We have a chance to get creative here, especially post pandemic. The urgency of meeting the academic and social emotional needs of students who are most impacted is important. Even small disruptions in students' lives can have big impacts on the academic performance. There is no way we can en endure a crisis as tragic and disruptive as a pandemic without major impacts on student learning. Many of you are educators and have seen the impact up close. Others are principals, administrators, superintendents, state education chiefs, and leaders nationwide. And many are also parents who have watched your own children struggle with this disruption. Whatever your perspective is, let's all agree, this is a moment of truth for education. Moving forward, public education is important. We continue to see growing attacks in public education, teaching honest history and student overall well-being. It's heartbreaking to see politicians trying to prevent students from learning about their history art, culture, and contributions and experience of African-Americans, especially when black history, which is vital, a vital part of our, our American history and story. They want to ban kids from learning the truth when it doesn't align with their political agenda. I'm not here to give a political speech, I wanna be clear. But 
I do want to make sure we address that because it is something we are seeing. While some politicians choose chaos in classrooms, the Biden-Harris administration is equipping schools and students with the resources they need. This education department will continue to engage directly with parents, families, about what they want to see their children's education and help schools develop best practices to, to be true partners with parents, teachers, and administrators. It is important that we move past the partisan bickering that distracts from the real work we need to do, which is why we believe in raising the bar. So every child in America can receive a comprehensive education, excellent education that enables them to achieve their dreams. Thank you, glad to be here. Uh, these superintendents, I looked them all up and I'm kind of wowed uh, to be here to even speak with on their level. Their level is literally raising the bar and leading the world. Thank you from the Department of Education. Peace and blessings. All right, I am excited. We've talked about the data, we've talked about the research, we've talked about theoretically what should be happening and what we're doing. Now we're gonna hear what's actually happening. Bring life to the data and the research. I'm gonna ask our moderator and our expert panelists to join me here on the stage. Our moderator is Arthur Jones II. He's a producer and reporter at ABC News. He focuses on education, federal policy, and how the pandemic affected students and teachers across the country. Dr. Melanie K. Wyatt is the superintendent of Alexandria City Public Schools in Virginia. And we want to congratulate Melanie for being appointed permanent superintendent last year. At the division as interim superintendent since last September. Dr. Latanya Goffney is the superintendent of Aldine Independent District in Houston, Texas. She's joining us all the way from Texas. Thank you. She joined that district in July of 2018. She previously served as the superintendent of Lufkin ISD. She has been named the superintendent of the year by the Texas Association of School Boards in 2017. And she has also been named president-elect of the National Association of Black School Educators. <laughs> Dr. Sonia Brooken Santelises, the CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools. So we are delighted to welcome Sonia back to the Education Trust. <laughs> In between serving as Chief Academic Officer for Baltimore City and then returning to the district at CEO, we had the honor of working with her at Education Trust and leading us in our education equity, education equity um, efforts. So these three women are truly education equity champions, influencing over 150 students uh, daily in their districts. Author, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the Education Trust, the School Superintendents Association for having me and us today. Black women leading with excellence. Is that, is that right? Black women leading yes. with excellence? Yes. <laughs> black women leading with excellence. They said you say it three times and you can remember it. So <laughs> black women leading with excellence. Uh, I want to thank you again, Dr. K. Wyatt. Just last week was named permanent superintendent right here in Alexandria, Virginia. But we talked about this earlier. You're from Prince George's County, Maryland. I, I am. I grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland. This so, is a DMV. Um, from the DMV. And uh, my, I, I was telling him my adult life was um, in Virginia because he was identifying all of my Virginia universities. <laughs> but I am a, a homegrown Prince George's County um, public school, proud public school um, product. So thank you. Now, thank you for the work that you do. I want to, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. And the Center for Black Educator Development, as we all know, uh, has said, thank a black teacher, right? So like we do in the church, I know we have a lot of black educators out here, okay? Turn to your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce yourself, be cozy, and tell them who your black educator that you want to thank. Real quick, just, I, I don't want to put you all in the spot so you have a time to think for about your answers. Let's, let's get a little communication going. Mm. I got a lot. Mm. A college? 
I had black male teachers in elementary school and one black um, female teacher. And that's all I can remember ever having. All right, now I want to hear these answers. I want to hear these answers. Now I want to hear these answers. Uh oh, don't. <laughs> Let's take, let's take it back up to the room. Let's take it back up to the stage. You got to hear me. Yeah, yeah. Look, I need one of these. You need to clap and they'll give yeah. you the teacher's day. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to have them respond now. Now that we're all, you know, acquainted with each other. I'm going to go to Dr. Goffney. Now, Dr. Goffney, is it Ms. Bradford that was your favorite oh, teacher? Oh, my gosh. Yes. How do you know Bradford? that? Okay. All right. No, I just, you know. She called me up. She told me she was coming. Do you? Okay. <laughs> what do you think? Listen, um, the, the, I wish she would have called you up because um, she's in heaven right now because she died during COVID, actually. But my first black teacher was Miss Bradford. And I am so thankful for this opportunity to begin this conversation and talk about someone who was so instrumental in my education. I'll never forget because I was raised in the country. I'm from Cold Spring, Texas, small town Cold Spring. And uh, there were very few examples of people who look like me and being raised in poverty by my grandparents and um, just not having lots of models in the home as well as uh, in other areas other than the church of course and that's a different conversation but I'll never forget Miss Bradford and I'll make it quick. Miss Bradford was my fourth grade teacher and she was the she was a teacher teacher she wore the teacher's clothes hair pulled back in a bun uh, just beautiful, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be like Miss Bradford. I saw her, she wore heels, she was smart, but the one thing that she did that really got my attention is Miss Bradford gave Tootsie Rolls. If you made a hundred on your test, <laughs> spelling test every Friday, or competed in math quiz, and so I worked hard for a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> and I love Tootsie Rolls to this day, but yeah, Miss Bradford, thank you for the opportunity to share absolutely, about Miss Bradford. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure you got that sweet tooth now. You got all A's. You know you got all A's. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Santalisis, you are with a, amongst friends right now, okay? She used to work here, and now you're back with Baltimore City Public Schools. You're the CEO. Who was it for you? Which black teacher do you want to thank during Teacher Appreciation Week? Well, it's really interesting because I was just telling uh, Dr. Goffney that all of K-12, I actually did not have uh, one black teacher except for a substitute one year in fifth grade. And so my first black teacher was probably my dad um, mm -hmm. because he taught black history at, a, at the local community college. And so he was the one who taught me fractions. He was the one who taught me black history. And so, you know, it is, it's a surreal kind of feeling when, you, when you're in the field and you're like, oh my God. And like, you know, my own girls would not say that they've had black teachers before I did, but literally I went my whole K-12 um, career and my dad was the only other person, right, who taught me. And so by the time I got to university level and actually had black professors, it was like, oh, this is neat, right? Like I actually get to see, and um, he's gone now, um, but Anani Dejenjo, who was on the faculty at Brown for Africana and um, uh, African American Studies, um, was amazing. And he was my unofficial advisor in my four years uh, there, and just really powerful. But yeah, so I'd say probably my dad and Anani. Let's give it up. Black fathers, black male educators, you know, we just got to give it up for that. That was a great testimony right there. And Dr. K. Wyatt, your black teacher that you would like to thank? I only get one because I was fortunate to have several in elementary school. Um, my first female was Miss St. Hillary. And, um, you know, when you're young in elementary school, I felt like she was like becoming friends with, with my with my parents because she always seemed to be there. Then I realized now as an adult, my parents were always involved in the school. So if you had that PTA mom who always was there, so you know, you're know you kind of uncomfortable with that. But now I'm so so grateful that my mother was always there, right? <laughs> in the schools with me. Um, and so Miss St. Hillary um, definitely comes to mind. And uh, I have two more, um, and these are males. And it was a Mr. Thomas. And really one that I want to point out was Mr. Nealon. Um, I did not like math, okay? Math still doesn't like me, so if you check my checkbook. Um, but I'm good with budgets, just let everybody know. Okay, I, I, I'm good with budgets, so city council's mayor was watching, I'm good, school board, I'm good. Um, so, 
But math was not my subject. And he had an advanced section of math, even in elementary school, and he would push the students of color in Landover, Maryland, to excel. And I'm thinking, I don't really want to be a part of this group. But he was determined to make me a part of this group. And he would push us to the point where I didn't even want to go to school at one point because I just said, I cannot do this. And he's like, you're going to learn algebra in elementary school. And he would just push. Now, I don't know if it was a curriculum back then, right? Because we're like in fourth, maybe fourth grade, fifth grade. But he pulled us and pushed us to a point where I really start to enjoy math, right? But he would not give up on us. And he would reward us. And, I don't, and this, please don't do this in schools now because there was this kitchen in the back of the school. I don't know why there was a kitchen back then in the back of the school, but he would prepare. Once you were successful, he would honor you and a group of students with this amazing lunch, you know, and, and it was fancy and it was all of these great things and you felt like you were really special because not only did you achieve in math, but he pulled you in to, I guess it was the faculty room, you know, we're little, we're like, okay, we're going in, there's a tablecloth and he would cook for us. And he said, this is to celebrate you. And you would have your friends there and you can invite your friends. And so then everyone started to want to be in his class and love math. So for me, it was Mr. Nilon. And, um, and I just always think about him and honor him. That's so special. That's so special. We talk about st shortages right now, STEM, special education, those subject matter shortages, um, black male educators, that shortage. Uh, they're all lumped together right now. Um, so for you to bring somebody like that to light was really powerful. Thank you. Um, it's also Mental Health Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And this conversation is going to be uplifting. It is going to be inspiring. It's going to be powerful because look at these three women we have up here. Um, but I do, want, I do want to do a checkup with you all. Uh, Dr. Goffney, again, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how, how are you feeling right now? How are you mentally right now? Well, my chief of staff is nervous uh, because <laughs> she knows that I'm honest, I'm an open book, and recognizing that I have people who are watching from across the country, I, I have to be honest. Um, really, um, I'm going to say a seven only because I'm around um, the power in this room. It was amazing just to walk in and feel the energy and to see my sister suits from across the, the country, but really, things are tough. The job is tough, and we're facing some challenges and so I round up to a seven because I'm in this room and in this space. But if I wasn't, it would probably be closer to a five or six because it has become, it's become increasingly tough. Can I quickly follow up with you? What would help your mental space right now? Leading your school district personally, spiritually, emotionally, what would help you to get to that eight or nine? Uh, I think, um, honestly, I just believe that um, it's one of those things that uh, to whom much is given, much is required. Um, it's These jobs aren't magic. It requires work and intentionality. And I am strengthened, again, by um, sisterhood across the country, uh, support, and just acknowledgement today. I mean, I've been a superintendent for 15 years, and I've never been a part of a panel that focused on the black woman's experience. And so to hear the researchers talk about 1.4 percent, yeah. literally, we don't realize just um, how abnormal it is to be in these positions and some of the challenges and things that we just have to go through being the first. And so and we're working hard to make sure we're not the last, as our, our, our vice president would say. So I don't think there's anything that anybody can do other than to acknowledge the work and to just be seen, you know, um, just be seen, be heard be supported and of course we believe in the power of prayer so mm -hmm. we see you we hear you and i know you be preaching i know you're a pastor and, and you're free <laughs> no, time. my husband's a pastor i'm not the pastor <laughs> <laughs> but i am an education evangelist okay <laughs> <laughs> and we talk about being seen being heard and being the first so dr k wyatt again the first black woman mm -hmm. to be the leader of the alexandria city wow. public schools where are you right now just four days ago you were named Permanent superintendent. Don't remind me, it's only been four days. <laughs> um, you know, if you ask me in this moment, um, of course, you know, if you see us, we're always scurrying around, taking care of little things as we're um, preparing for this. We're always on, and I think that's something that, that everyone forgets. Um, it's an isolating role. Now, I haven't even been in this role for a year. I started in September as interim, and so you quickly um, feel 
yourself being isolated around from, from many of your community members. It's the sisterhood like this that really comes together. So I would say, um, you know, it's, a, it's I'm going to say a 6 to 6.5 because when I walked in, I have to say, and I, was, I think I was speaking with you, you know, it, it's, I was a little nervous being here because I'm thinking, I'm sitting and coming to be on stage with, with these great leaders. Um, she's so humble. Uh, <laughs> but, but the work that they've done, and when you're in a role like I was, I was you know, a principal, um, executive director, director, and some chief, and all those roles, you're looking up to women who are sitting beside me. So to be sitting on the stage with them is an emotional moment, right? Because I'm sitting here because of me watching their work and learning from them. So I'm gonna say a 6.5 because she gave me the 0.5 of filling my cup by just, even when she walked in, she recognized me and said, congratulations. So that sisterhood um, will really um, boost your, your wellness. So check on your sisters, check on, on your colleagues. Um, it's important, even though they may look okay, trust me, it's a heavy, heavy crown to wear. Thank you for being so open with your, your mental state. You know the irony that she said sitting here next to us? Yeah. Listen, I have loved this woman for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia said to Lise, I love her. <laughs> I was like following her on her website when I got, because I've been in smaller districts. I started out in a small school district, uh, about 1,700 kids. Then I moved to a district about 9,000. And then when I got to an urban area in which 67,000 kids and you know uh, the ninth largest in Texas, like who's doing this work for black, brown, and students of poverty? Yeah. And I don't know, it was an uh, article, and Ed, we, I don't know what it was, but Sonia's name popped up, and you were doing exceptional work, and I knew literacy was our issue, and I'm telling you, this woman is, I mean, amazing. So we all draw strength from each other, even if we would never met. And it was a year or two later, we were gonna go visit your district, and we were gonna uh, collaborate, and then we all connected with Chiefs for Change, but I'm honored to just be sitting next to you. Wow. And so, yeah. I'm honored to be up here with this sisterhood. Right <laughs> I really am. I, I really am. And, and Dr. Santelisis, you know, what is it about the sisterhood that, that helps you with your mental state? And, and where are you right now mentally? So, well, one, I think it's important to know that we, <coughs> you know, and, th and this I, I feel comfortable saying, and th they'll tell me if I'm off, but it's not always the same every day. Mm -hmm. Right. So you got me today on a nine day mm -hmm. and you got me on a hey girl, um, <laughs> you got me on a nine day because uh, I got to announce teacher of the year for Baltimore oh, yeah. City today. Yeah. Um, black male music teacher in one of our toughest schools, just doing amazing things for kids. You know, I got to see their performance of Annie. They had not had a musical in that school in like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's an update, right? It's an update when your principals get what you're saying and they're putting it, you know, in motion. So yeah, it's a nine day today, but I will tell you, and I think it's really important, and this gets to the sisterhood, right? And then, you know, everybody's being nice, like, oh, I said, look, I sent my people to go visit LaTanya when we were doing high school curriculum, uh, English curriculum. So I just want everybody to know she says that. And they were like, well, you know, what about this? I said, who is using it? And they listed four people. And they, my people know, they're like, well, you know, Dr. Goffney's district is using it. And I said, okay, you're going to Dr. Goffney's district. So it's reciprocal. But I think what's important to know is on a day when I was a two, mm -hmm. right? And Christina and other folks know who were there. On a day I was a two, the governor of Maryland at the time had just gone off with a screed that was political. And I tend to be, you know, fairly strong because my faith keeps me strong, right? But it was a bad day. Like when the governor of your state is saying, we're going to bring criminal charges, right? You might remember, we're going to bring criminal charges against the superintendent, right, of Baltimore City Public Schools, and to have like lawyers calling you saying he's just ranting, don't worry about it, there's nothing to it, it doesn't matter, right? Like you're targeted. And I remember like my staff came in and said, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. But I wasn't okay. And I got on a plane and I was headed to Florida because there were a group of black 
women superintendents. Um, Sharon Contreras, I'll give her a shout out. She's <laughs> retired now, but got us all together. And we met at Bethune Cookman for a photo shoot. And I will tell you, I was on the plane and I can't even remember the praise and worship song I put on, but I put it in my ears. I was sobbing on the plane. I thought the man next to me was going to be like a uh, flight attendant. <laughs> I was. I was sobbing on the plane. I texted a, um, a pastor friend of mine. I didn't even want to tell my husband because I was afraid he was literally going to be arrested for punching the governor of our state um, in the nose. So I couldn't call him yet. And I was sitting there on the plane. And, you know, again, the only thing that got me through that plane ride was that praise and worship song. I land and I have four black women who are like, and I'm thinking, oh no, you guys have already gone to the hotel. You remember, Christina? You've already gone to the hotel. They were like, girl, the hotel? We knew your flight was delayed. We're still here waiting for you. And it was like 11.45 at night, I think. And they were waiting for me. And I think that's symbolic of what the sisterhood means. On my worst day, they were my best therapy. God had them when I was a two, and I left as a 10, mm. right? But Tanya was flying, her, her baby girl was a senior and had a big <laughs> ceremony, and she flew in because she had to be there. And so, I don't know, there were like 20 of us or something, and I gotta tell you, everybody was like, Carl, you know what's gonna be okay? And let's go do this, and let's go do that, and why are you worried about it? And then you go to like Bethune Cookman, and we're standing in front of the statue of Mary McLeod Bethune, right? One of my favorite stories is like, you know, she and three other black women were encircled by the Klan mm -hmm. with torches, mm -hmm. with little girls, and they began singing hymns, right? And so I'm sitting here like, girl, and you got some governor <laughs> saying something about you? And oh, by the way, I outlasted him. Yeah. So, I'm not trying to be cheeky, but I'm trying to say that God has a strength in a sisterhood of people who you can be vulnerable with. Because I couldn't break down crying in front of my staff. I mean, let's just say that I know it's live stream, but no, I'm not going to break down in tears in front of my staff. But when I got on the plane and when I got off the plane, I had a community of people who could be real, who could recalibrate me, who I could focus in on and frankly, connecting with the history, right? And, and when I got that, just, you know, somebody screamed. And again, my lawyers were telling me, I don't know why you're so upset. This is just a political stunt. He's not gonna do anything to you. But it didn't matter. And so I think the piece really is about the continuum and recognizing riding the wave and knowing where to go when you need the support. And that is why, for all of the craziness of this being a time to be a black woman superintendent, I actually, I was saying this to Christina before we got up here, I actually think this is a great time because the sisterhood is such that you have people you can call and that was not always the case. What is it about the sisterhood of the 1.4%, right? That when you say, when you have this thought of, I don't really know if I have the support right around me in my district that I need to be successful. Dr. Goffney, you've been in a few different districts. What do you do? It's tough. It really is tough. And all the, um, we know that leadership matters. And so and we know we can't do this work alone. And so the, the most important thing that we do is hire. And so I talk about the importance of hiring well. And so um, I'm very proud of the teams I've been able to build. But as uh, my sister Sue just alluded to, you still ha are expected to be strong. There's certain expectations of the position. And so what I love about the sister soups or our sisterhood that you just alluded to is I don't have to be strong. I don't have to be fake. When I walked in the room, she, Christina already knew how I felt. She already knows how I feel. I mean, like literally uh, everyone else, I have to smile and do all the things. And, you know, there may be a camera, someone may take a picture and all all the other things we could get past the pleasantries and just get to the raw authentic um person that you are and say who how you are and you know what you need and so that's what i appreciate about the sisterhood and i also appreciate that it doesn't matter where you serve or how you serve she's new never met her a day in my life until today well, I've been following but she's you. a sister already <laughs> like literally <laughs> Because we recognize um, that it's going to take all of us together, because 
we're anomalies. I'll never forget when I was um, in Texas and because I was serving in a rural area, had not gone out that much. And um, the reason why I'm so excited about being the president-elect of the National Association of Black School Educators, or National Alliance of Black School Educators, is because I was serving in a small town, um, not many people who look like me, and I went to this conference in Texas called the Texas Alliance of Black School Educators. And I walk in, and at the time I was ABD, hadn't finished my doctorate. I walk in and I see all these beautiful black people. And I'll be honest with you, because we are sometimes so focused on assimilating and trying to show people what we can do and trying to, you know, um, just prove to people that we have this worth, there are many times that we never get to sit in our blackness. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was just amazed. I saw all these doctors and different people who were working on their doctorate, and so it gave me the courage that I could finish. And then recognizing at the time, because Texas is, you know, we think we run things in Texas. We have over 1,200 school districts, and of those 1,200 school districts, when I became a superintendent, there were only four, <laughs> four African-American school, African-American female superintendents in the whole state. And so you, we don't see each other. And so to be in a room and in a space where you can be authentically yourself and you can relate is powerful because you feel like a unicorn. You do at times. And people treat you like that. But there's power, I think, in the collective experience of all of us. I just want to celebrate the black women superintendents right now because black women are actually the highest educated teachers and educators in the nation. Mm. And that comes directly from Dr. Leslie T. Fenwick's, Fenwick's book, um, the Jim Crow's pink slip, right? The untold story of principal and teacher leadership, black principal and teacher leadership. And she texted me that earlier today. She said to quote her directly. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. That's a Dr. good one. Fenwick, who's also a, a black woman, you know, leading in the space, you know, with a doctoral degree, as you all have. So, you know, I just want to celebrate that really quickly. That 1.4%, they have the most doctoral degrees of the superintendent. Just so everyone knows, Dr. Grant, Dr. McKnight, everyone, <laughs> just so everyone knows that. Um, and Dr. K. Wyatt, you're the newest of the bunch. Did, how have you been leaning on them, right? Where, 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 did you bring the playbook for her? Did you bring the script for her? I, I, I need a playbook. She has it? <laughs> she has it? I just want to shout out Denisa one more time because her work with Dr. Latanya McDade, who was the first black, mm -hmm. first black sister, Latanya McDade to run Prince William County. She said there was no playbook, not at the K through 12 level, not for black women. Maybe this was somebody else, but not for black women. And that was in your reporting. So thank you for doing that as well. Did, so did you get your playbook? Did you get your I did not get mine. I'll be expecting it on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but speaking to um, Latanya, um, immediately, even as interim, she reached out to me and she was a role model um, before so she's watching um, I told her watch she's probably busy doing something else but um, she reached out to me as interim to make sure that I was prepared and and does that check-in on me um, and I think that's important I said that before but you know like you said we just met for the first time but I was watching I'm watching you know and, and I think that's important that we speak up about it and reach out don't wait for someone um, you can't just sit there and you're in your home and wait and think it's going to happen. If you know that there's someone in a role, reach out to them and bring them up. And I think it's also important to, to know that if you see another woman who is aspiring to do that, whether they have the skill set or not, it's up to us to bring them to the table. And when we bring them to the table, so often we have to make sure that we don't just walk away from that table, that we come back and check on all of those, those women who are sitting there to make sure that not only are they okay, but ask the right questions. Because are you okay gets you, yes, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm good. And I am horrible. I say that all the time when I know I'm a six. And then I surround myself with people like a Latanya McDade and, and other women leaders who are not even just superintendents, other executive directors and chiefs who will come and do those checks on you. So I think that's important to surround yourself with people who are honest about those check-ins. Mm -hmm. Dr. Santalisis, who, who checked on you, right, when you were starting out? Uh, 2019 Teacher of the Year, Dr. Richard Warren Jr. said on the Edifying Together podcast, Success on any level is preceded by supports on many levels. Who, who checked on you to support you in that moment? So it actually was a variety of people. 
right? There wasn't just kind of one person who checked. And, and it was a diverse group, racially, gender-wise, ethnically. And I, th I think that there's a, you know, what, one of the things that I am very big on with folks who ask me either for advice or who are, you know, early in their career. And I think we all try to make time for people to give back. But one of the things I tell folks is, you don't know the package that your help is coming in. And so, you know, some of the people I called were actually white men who had expended their capital on my behalf and didn't have to, right? And so, you know, I would call and say, all right, I'm getting ready to go into this first meeting with this group of bankers, right? This is what I'm thinking, tell me what you're thinking, because I knew that they knew that space and I wanted to check like my own thinking. But then I had folks who I called who I went to grad school with, right? Who, a matter of fact, I'll never forget Bob Peterkin, if he's watching, right? He came and led, you know, my uh, former black superint male superintendent in Milwaukee, was my, one of my advisors um, for grad school. He came and led my transition team. Like he did all that groundwork. He told me where some of the, he was like, Sonia, in that department, you need to make sure you push because those people did not know what they were talking about, right? And so it's, it's who's gonna run interference. And then there were people who were in the community, right? Who were Baltimoreans who were not educators, people who live in West Baltimore, people who are not in the rooms I'm in, but they have my back. And so I went, I'll never forget, I went to a funeral, my first funeral as superintendent, and I went into um, a funeral parlor that was basically one of the row houses. And, you know, I'm walking and, and you know, all of a sudden the whispers start. Who is that? Is that who I think it is? Who is that? Who is that? And somebody, I'll never forget, God bless Mama B. She came out and she said, you're the new superintendent. You're the new CEO, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she nodded to a couple of people in the crowd. She said, she said we're going we gonna to help you through this. They ushered me through the crowd. They introduced me to key people on the ground. They went through the viewing with me. And to this day, like, Mama B has my back. Right? Like when we have a murder, she and people like her that I met that day are the ones who do the work on the weekends when everybody else goes home to make sure there's not retaliation. So I use all of those. Like, so everybody from like Tom Paisan, right, who was a fabulous um, mentor, to like Bob Peterkin, to other black female superintendents who I call, but also people in the community who frankly don't have the degrees, who aren't sitting in the same spaces, but who are experts in the context in which our children live and have the connections that will have your back in ways that the Chamber of Commerce cannot. And so that's why this piece about seeing your mentorship in multiple packages in different shades and flavors, I think is really important because if you think your help is only coming from one place, you will be sunk because you don't know who's going to have what you need at a particular time. And so you collect, it's a journey of collecting wisdom from others along the way and never thinking you've arrived, which is why, you know, Latanya can say what she wants to. I went, I sent my people to her when I wanted to verify a particular curriculum piece. And so I think that that for me is how I approach life. Because if I, if I only look for it in a package, I'm gonna miss something mm -hmm. that somebody has that I that will make me better. Mm -hmm. That power of mentorship, mm -hmm. right? That you all just talked about, that power of mentorship. Um, but education right now is, might be lacking a few mentors for certain individuals, right? There, there could be some challenges that you all are facing as well. I know I wanna make this an uplifting conversation, but there's many challenges that I'm hearing from educators right now. Dr. K. Wyatt, in 2022, 2023, why did you want to become a leader of a school district with so much going on right now? People always ask the why question, and I always push back with, why not? 
Excuse me? Good for you. Why not? Good for you. Why not? Why not? Why not? Let me rephrase the question. Yes. So, so let me answer that for you. Because of those teachers that we mentioned earlier and because of our parents and all those other people along the way that poured into us, why would we not want to give back to have impact? You know, I wake up every day. Of course, my faith is strong. And everyone in, in, in Alexandria teaches me because they know. I say, I have a word. It's not even a mantra. It's just one word, and it's impact. So when I wake up in the morning, I have my little routine, and I say, okay, today, what impact can I have on just one person? Or I'm hoping that some one person will have an impact on me. And sometimes it's small. We don't always identify what that is. But that's what I want to make sure that I do when I'm talking about my why is to remember that every day I have a chance to make a change and impact someone's life, whether it's small you know, it could be big. It just depends. It could be a student. It could be a parent. It could be a colleague. It could be a bus driver. Just knowing that you wake up with that opportunity, then, then why not? Why not do this work? And we know there are so many challenges right now in, in K-12 education. And we've, we've talked about the hard work. But it's produced so many great leaders for us, right? I, I think about when we see famous people on the television or reporters or actors or whatever they are in their roles and their careers, they're products of public education. So why would we not want to do this work and continue to build a great community? And so I always tell people the why is, you know, the impact plus passion is limitless possibilities. Which moment of impact this year? You haven't even been a whole year. Which moment of <laughs> impact this Stop year? Stop reminding me it hasn't been a whole year. I'm oh. just doing a great job oh. with everything. Yeah, what was the most rewarding for you? The most rewarding other than um, making sure that we really changed a lot of things around safety and trying to put some safety measures in place. Um, I've had to make some hard decisions. So I don't know if I can name just one thing other than just putting kids first in everything that I do. It's not, I, I can't even think of one thing um, because there's so many little things. I think of the students that I met um, and, a, and a mom that came up to me and, and the, the little girl um, was telling her mom, um, I had my hair natural that day and she goes, my hair is just like hers, right? And she's pointing at me and, and she's a sixth grader, one of our middle schoolers. So, you know, I think of those little moments as to why I do those big things. But to really narrow down um, one instance in this year, I'm just proud that um, I was able to surround myself and I have a great leadership team, I have great board support and great community support, and just know that um, no matter what, whatever idea or whatever kind of resource or program we wanted to do, that they came and supported me along this way. Mm. Dr. Goffney, we talk about students a lot here. Is it the students that keeps you coming back? Is it the students that you wanted to lead into the next generation? Uh, what is it for, for you? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Of course it's the students. But um, I have this saying, when anyone calls me and they ask, how are you doing? I always say I'm living the dream. And so um, and we're all living the dream. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier uh, from Ed Trust, and we were talking about how you know, when our ancestors got off the slave ships and they uh, were slaves, but the black women, what did we do? We took care of families, we took care of houses, we took care of children. And so black women have been taking care of children since they arrived in this country. And I think about the fact that I'm living that, my ancestors' dreams. You know, my, my grandmother, she uh, had a fifth grade education and worked as a housekeeper and took care of families, took care of children with a fifth grade education. And my grandfather, he couldn't read. He wrote his name with an X, but he took care of people's houses and their lawns. And I think about the challenges that they had. So black people, black women in general, we've always had to do hard things. And so the fact that I get to live in this moment and be able to uh, make a difference for people, um, because without an education, I wouldn't be sitting here. There's nothing about my my past that would have predicted it. My, my mom had me when she was 15. She didn't graduate from high school. Grandparents didn't graduate. So education, teachers, mm -hmm. is the reason I'm sitting here. So every day I show up <laughs> in the midst of these challenges, excited about the opportunity to be able to make a difference for so many who are depending on me, just like I was depending on the educators that came before me. 
And I recognize that no matter how hard it gets, um, my grandmother cleaned toilets. My grandfather had to do all kinds of I mean, just no matter how hard it is, it's, ne it's not that hard. You know, it's just, it, it pulls on the heartstrings of everybody and, because I know that where there's unity, there's strength. But I recognize too that we're called for such a time as this. And I believe that black women, women are called to do this work, especially during these tough times. Mm -hmm. You're living your grandmother's greatest dreams right now. Absolutely. You sure she, could, she couldn't even imagine it. She would be like, <laughs> you were sat with somebody on TV? <laughs> <laughs> Mo would not, oh, my big mama would be so proud that I'm sitting with you. <laughs> we love it. We thank you for that. And Dr. Santalisas, what is, what is your motivation? You know, where does that drive come from? Who inspired you? I mean, it, it's very similar to what Kay and Latanya have said, right? Like, it is, this is generational work. And I said my first year in, um, you know, folks in Baltimore City will tell you this. I just want one generation in my leg on the race. Um, I'm not going to get them all. I can't dig back in the past and I can't predict the future. But on my watch, I want a generation. I want a generation. Yes, um, I am into community building. So as much as I am into children, and I think you heard some of this, right, from both Kay and LaTanya, like th this for me is about strong families, strong communities. And I am not, like I don't think any of us are and many of the, the folks in this room right now, the connection to the thriving of future generations, and maybe now, you know, because I'm 55, I'm like thinking in that way. But I, I am very clear about legacy. I am very clear about you know the excellence and the potential that is unrealized you know and i'm, I'm looking at tangi reed marshall now right and one of the things you talk about like fanny i remember reading tangi's stuff and thinking somebody gets the excellence partnered with right the wholeness of communities and and i love that because i feel like our systems force us into choices Either we deal with trauma, and, and this is a big thing maybe because of the city I live in, but in Baltimore, there's a lot of fixation on trauma right now. Mm -hmm. and, and it's getting to the point where we, if we are not careful, it is debilitating. Mm -hmm. And it is leaving a generation without hope. Mm -hmm. And so part of healing is seeing your potential. And we are disconnecting in our fixation on the system. We are disconnecting a generation from the power that, you know, the time you referred to slave ships, that got us here in the first place. You go back to, we, we had a superintendent's meeting in Tulsa, shout out to Deb Gist, who was a fabulous host. And, and we went to, you know, the Greenwood Museum. And a lot of people now are like, oh, do you know the story of North, North Tulsa? And it was this thriving black community and it was leveled. But the piece of the story that doesn't get told, and I said this to my principals last week, is the piece of the story that doesn't get told is that they rebuild. And actually the peak of wealth in black North Tulsa was actually post the decimation of the race massacre. So like, I gotta tell you, there is a narrative shift that I think we have gotta be careful of. And I tell people all the time, the only way to heal from trauma is not somebody holding a sign telling you you were traumatized. Art is healing. That musical I was in, there are babies who were performing today who did not know they could sing, did not know they could act. It was because of a quality arts program. Not reading is traumatic. So that's why I love you, Tim. This is why I love you. No, like for real. So like I had to talk to my principals. Yes, it's hard. Of course there is trauma. But if we had a higher black literacy rate during the great migration, during lynching, then what in God's name is our excuse for a generation of black and brown young people not being able to read? So like at some point, that's why I still do the work. 
because I cannot allow the strength of our ancestors, the people that came before us, our grandparents, who, who whether they scrubbed toilets or built a school, whatever they did, they did it knowing what the prize was. And I got to tell you, you know, and you can tell I've been in seven years because I don't really care. We better be careful. Because if we allow a narrative that our kids and our communities are so broken that we can't do anything for them until everything is perfect, then we are selling a generation down the river without anything to get them through to where they are supposed to be. They are dying from a lack of hope. That's why kids pull triggers. That's why they gang up on people. They have lost hope. And that is why at year seven I'm still here, because I refuse on my watch to allow the trauma to be all that people know about young people in Baltimore City or any place else. Mm. I'm just thinking about correcting that narrative, that narrative that black people, black students, black children have all these traumatic experiences and they, they can't make it, right? I'm doing a story right now on the literacy crisis where I'm gonna be traveling to different states and talking to black and brown students who are in fourth grade but are two and three and four grades behind in reading. I know you are all literacy champions up here, right? So where do we go from here with this crisis? Is, is reading the crisis right now that school leaders, black women school leaders have to combat and face? And if it is, where do we go, Dr. Goffney? <laughs> I believe that literacy is like the, the civil rights um, moment in our time, especially in Texas. Um, I'll, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with our commissioner of education. He was going over the NAEP results with us in 2019, and I had just gotten a job in, um, in Aldean and had looked at where we were as far as literacy. And um, Texas was at the bottom as far as black and brown children's performance. And he was talking about how we, um, how we got there, and he just said it, and I was one of the only uh, people in the room that looked like me. And he was gonna go on to the next topic, and I literally raised my hand and said, so are black people just inherently inferior? So I asked a rhetorical question just to get you to, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. And um, he knows I tell the story, and he said, he said no, of course not. And so at that moment, then my colleagues kind of leaned in and we began to have a conversation on why this was and what we're going to do about it. So if not, then what are we going to do? Are we going to still keep blaming children or are we going to look at how we teach and what we teach and when we teach and all the things? Because at that moment, I was on this journey to figure out how could we get literacy right because I'd just been named soup in this uh, particular school. And so um, that's what, <laughs> when I started following Sonia and looking for people who had made a difference for black children, brown children, and, and students of poverty as it related to literacy. And, and I know the pendulum swings, and I'm definitely not in an argument today for that, but what I do know is the way that we taught literacy has not moved the needle mm -hmm. for most children, but it especially has not moved the needle for, for black children. And so I'm really excited about where we are in Texas and how we were able to take a step back as a district and look at how we uh, approach literacy. And we literally uh, stepped away from a very popular model that um, the reason why we weren't making the outcomes was because it wasn't implemented with fidelity, because of the kids, because of this, and because of that, but no one wanted to take a look at uh, how we could do things differently. And so very proud of the journey we're on, and it's a slow <laughs> journey for sure, but um, excited about the conversations because we weren't even having conversations about why our black children weren't learning to read. It was, it, it, it just, I don't, I don't know, it just, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and we're trying to do the work in Texas and be the model of when you have the right people doing the right work, you get the right outcomes. So when we talk about the right people doing the right work, a lot of experts would say that it takes the whole community. Absolutely. It takes parents working with educators, working with the students, working with the tutors. And, and the whole entire community um, with the literacy crisis, with a lot of these issues, especially post-pandemic. Um, Dr. K. Wyatt, what are you doing to help recruit the next Dr. K. Wyatt? How are you reaching into the community to do that? 
like I said, four days in. Let us know the yeah, secret sauce. Lot for four days in, the secret <laughs> sauce. The secret sauce is um, having that hope. I hear that a lot. And knowing that you can build partnerships with different agencies, and we're very fortunate um, where I am in Alexandria, that we can build those partnerships and we're bringing in pipeline um, like college students, even some, you know, maybe volunteers who never thought about going into education. And they look like our students, right? They look like all of our students because they live in the community. So it is my responsibility to continue to grow them in whatever capacity that they're serving in, whether it's a partnership, if they're volunteering, if they're a tutor, whatever that is, to let them know about those opportunities in education. Because all too often, they don't know about the even um, alternative ways to, to becoming um, educators. They are just like, well, you know, I already have a degree um, in English, but guess what? I didn't know I can become a teacher. I think those conversations need to happen. They need to happen frequently. And that's about bringing folks to the table that I spoke about earlier. But it's those partnerships that really um, continue to build the work that we're doing around literacy. I got to, yeah, I got to finish this one. <laughs> partnerships, pipeline programs. Dr. Santelisis, how are you developing the next pipeline of black women leading with excellence? Because when y'all get there, y'all lead with excellence. That's what it says up on the board. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, sorry. I think some of it is part of what you heard in the opening is one, being sure that we are looking in different places. So very quickly, um, our most successful tutoring initiative is an in-district tutoring initiative with paraprofessionals from Baltimore City. These are women who, predominantly women, who are not fully certified, but who, to Latanya's earlier point, we went deep in developing them in early literacy and their gains are outpacing some of our other tutoring partners. Mm. So what that says to me is we actually have hidden pipelines of people that we overlooked that we need to tap into. The other piece about leadership, you know, and, and my folks will tell you back in Baltimore City, I was like, look, just being black ain't enough, thank you. Mm -hmm. So how are we developing and giving opportunities and experiences? Because oftentimes the desire is there, but we heard from our researcher that, you know, the pipelines are about experiences and how you get that. And so part of what we've tried to do is be very deliberate based on our feedback from our black teachers specifically about where they see the barriers. And, you know, shout out to Ed Trust, Right, The research on black teachers was born out in Baltimore City. They were the ones who were most likely to be left back to make sure the school didn't blow up while everybody else got to go to the fancy central development with the big name. And so we had to rework how we freed up which people for which developmental experiences because that's where we saw the differences. We saw the difference is who actually had the exposure to developing the skills that we wanted. So a lot of it is about, a lot of the equity work now is around affirmative development. Because to Latanya's point, like the question everybody has is, well, maybe they just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And since we know that's not the case, then now the question becomes, what do we have to change in how we both identify, develop, and actually continue to support. So that, that's where some of our work is, um, I think, right now. Mm. I'm going to end it with you, Dr. Goffney. You know, during, during a teacher shortage, paraprofessional shortage, there's educators around. The bus drivers, I think, uh, in uh, Montgomery County had a, a big bus driver shortage, correct? You know, back, back, yeah, we did. We talked about it. Yeah. Um, how do you continue to strengthen those pipelines? Because they're there, they're here, you know, they're not hiding. But there's so much, you know, teachers say disrespect out there. There is a pay scale issue out there. Where do we reach into the community and go and get them from? Listen, 
all they need is hiring. So if you would like to complete an application, please see us afterwards. We will pay for you to have a... No, as soon as I'm closer. <laughs> no, it, that's probably um, one of the areas in which I think as a country that we should be talking about because the, the, the teacher vacancies is, is going to um, be a challenge, especially for districts that look like our districts that are predominantly black, brown, and students of poverty, and they have options. And I think one of the areas in which we definitely need to look, because we've been doing it for centuries, is the black uh, w woman. I know y'all probably think I tell a lot of stories, but I'll end with this one, because I had this opportunity to, uh, we were interviewing for our executive director of family and community engagement, and she was uh, Hispanic. She was bilingual, and when she moved to this country, she didn't speak any English. And her first teacher was what? A black woman. Mm -hmm. And she said, the, my first teacher did not speak my language, but she spoke to my heart. Mm -hmm. And so we know that black women speak to the hearts of kids, to the hearts of people. And so I think that there's a whole hidden, possibly uh, pipeline of people that if we can grow our own, I think we focus a lot on getting this niche or you're bilingual this or you this, but just getting people who have the ability to speak to the hearts of our kids and to join us on this journey as we demonstrate what's possible again when you have the right people doing the right work so that our students can graduate with choices and opportunities. We've got to have the right people. But I think there's an opportunity. Parents, <laughs> we're shaking the trees. <laughs> Panel, I want to thank you all so much. Black women, three black women sitting in the Thank you. Yeah. I want to leave you all with another quote. From, from your story, from your story in there. Dr. Janice Jackson, former yes. Chicago. You know, we have the capabilities, we have the competence, we have the answers and the skills for this job. She's talking about black women. She's talking about that 1.4%. You have it all. You even got the doctoral degrees. One, two, three, four. It's too many to count in here. <laughs> all of you have everything that you need and so keep leading the way thank you so much for everything like that and malcolm x also said education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today so thank you all for being here thank you So we are fortunate in the D.C. area to see, be surrounded by dynamic black women leaders. So we wanted to use this opportunity to also hear from some of our other leaders in the area. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Monifa McKnight. She's the superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. After following her, we will hear from Dr. Christina Grant. She's the state superintendent of education for Washington, D.C. And then... And we will hear from our own president and CEO, Denise Ford. I want to thank Denise for being the leader here, giving us the opportunity to have this conversation, encouraging us to always put students first. I also want to thank her for supporting the communications team and a shout out to the Education Trust communications team for pulling this event together, to our senior director, Nicole Grayson, who was Woo. able to envision it. <laughs> After Denise, we are going to end with powerful words from Oakland Unified Superintendent, Dr. Kyla Johnson Trammell. She has a call to action for all of us. Thank you. Dr. McKnight. All right, good evening, everyone. Walking in here was like walking into a family reunion. <laughs> I must say, just so, so nice to be with all of you this evening. Literally, I came in and sat in the back of the room. And of course, I'm only seeing the back of everybody's head. I saw Dr. Sandlis is my colleague there uh, first. But as I look around the room, I'm like, what? How fortunate am I to be a part of the sisterhood um, that is represented so strongly in this room today? So I, I'm just honored to be here and to be in the presence of many, many great women who are contributing to education in so many significant ways. I first want to thank our panel. Um, I am inspired all over again. And I came in, I'm trying to figure out what number. Um, it was, it was, it's been a tough week. Um, it has been a tough week and you know, I came in thinking I am exhausted, but this burst of energy came as I just sat 
and listen to you so intently um, that just gives us exactly what we need in the moments that we need. So I want to thank you, Dr. Santelises, uh, Dr. Gothney, yes, and uh, Dr. K. Wyatt. I, I am just so grateful. Um, and I be believe they shared a few themes tonight that we should all just walk away with that um, if we came into the room not thinking about them, these are things that we should take away with us. And it is, who do we need to check on? Um, who do we need to check on? We always need to check on one another and we always need to check on um, those who are constantly giving to others. And that's what education is, right? This is a service oriented uh, work, service oriented work that we do. And so that's hard. And not only that, it's not just about working with people, it's working with people's children, mm -hmm. which is something that everybody cares about and pays attention to. And so it's not the easiest time, but I think it's always an opportunity when you're working through not the easiest moments. So I think from the conversation we're having today, the question does become, you know, who do we need to check on? Who do we need to check in with to make sure we're contributing and not always just taking, right? Um, so I thank you for, for, for sharing that and, and reminding us of how important that is. Um, one thing that struck me as you all were talking and it's the importance of always leaving with care and compassion at the end of the day, right? On the toughest day and on the easiest day, remembering our why. And leading with care and compassion means that even in the toughest moment when people try you at every level mm -hmm. and you have not this much left of patience, it's, but what do I care about the most? And how is this moment going to help me take care of what I care about or get in the way of it? So thank you for just modeling that type of leadership in the way that you express um, the importance of inspiring those young ladies who are um, excited when they do see us walking up with our natural hair, which I'm missing already just one day out of it, you know, or the community members that need to see us beyond just the superintendent and recognize that we can work with everybody and we should be able to work with everybody and identify with everybody within the community that we serve. Those are really, really important components. And then always thinking about what are we doing to help empower the people after us. So I think about this often because people say, oh, you're the first woman and um, the second person of color to lead in a school system that's 165 years old. And while you walk into that situation and from everything that represents masculinity in the history of 165 years that you see, but no one else does because it's mixed into the culture, um, you think about how powerful that is and how it ever can't go back to that. So, you know, and, and it, it just exists in every space if you can possibly imagine, every space within an organization that only one person gets to feel and see. And so, of course, there's an immediate urgency to say, well, while I am here now, and for me, it feels like it's been a decade, <laughs> but it really has only been one official year and, you know, two years in the working and, two, and one year is interim and one year is permanent. And so that means you have to really look at ways to pour into other people and invest in them. And when you meet them and they ask you something about the work that you do or how you got to where you be, you take that moment not to just answer the question for them, but you take that moment to say, what can I say to them that leaves them with inspiration that makes them believe that they can do this too? I remember hearing in my career, a lot of people saying, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard and you have to do this or you have a family, or you have to do this and you can't get your doctorate. All of those expectations that people set for us in their minds, we have to constantly overcome. And so for the next set of people who say, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this job and have children? We tell them how we did it. We tell them how we do it. How am I going to continue my education and do this job? we tell them how we did it or how we're doing it so that they can feel that they are able to accomplish that. Because one thing that does get to me, and I, I have to be, I'm always honest, um, 
<laughs> I, I am one who, you know, I tell it like it is. And one thing that we have to get over is the exclusiveness that people believe that we're supposed to represent when we're the only one that perpetuates that it should just be one. And when we think like that, because unfortunately in many ways history has shaped us to think like that, and we have to fight against that, you have to think about those moments in which we are, you know, um, investing in people and answering their questions to help them believe that they can and should be what it is that they want to accomplish. And I think that's a call to action for all of us because we can't just address the needs that are in front of us right now, but right now we have to plan for not only the needs that are in front of us, but the needs are that are in the future and planning for that now in those interactions. So I am just, again, grateful that I've had an opportunity to be here and be inspired and listen and uh, listen to so many and hear from so many uh, perspectives around this work because we have a lot of work to do. And just because we're black women, it also doesn't mean that we're gonna fix all the problems um, immediately, particularly within the black community or within a community of color because we are of color. People expect that of us. Um, and of course we're here because we wanna fix it. And we know that we are going to make it better. That's why we're here, um, but it does, you know, include a level of tax on us because we feel that pressure innately to do it because that's why we're here. But we also have to help other people realize we're trying to overcome, I mean, decades and decades and decades of issues that have been established over time. Um, but even with that said, we have the capacity to make that change and reminding and supporting one another along the way that we can do it and all the tools that we have within our toolkit, our kitchen cabinet, each other, and so many others to do it is what's key. So I just want to end with my graciousness um, and share that I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful to Ed Trust for hosting um, this event and um, for all who contributed the time to be here for us to convene together this evening. Because I know if I were to ask you, there was some place else you should have been technically when you look at your calendar, but we chose to come here and make this time important for us tonight. So thank you for making it a valuable opportunity for me. And I hope that I am able to support and help uh, anyone that's here in this room tonight and anyone who reaches out as I do to others to help support us in this work. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can tell that the sisterhood is real, but it is. Um, we get giddy when we're in the same room because we don't see each other often. Um, again, I guess I get to greet you on behalf of Washington, D.C., um, our nation's capital, where I get the joy of serving as our state superintendent, which is a fun fact in that we aren't a state, but there are 58 what we call state superintendents or secretaries of education or commissioners of education, depending on where you are in our country. And I was this morning counting, I was like, how many of us are black women? I think I'm at four um, because Penny just announced. And so I, I, so I want to share with you what 1.4% feels like. It feels like you can walk into a room and see you, both your mentors, your best friend, the person you were on the phone crying with last night. We live in a group chat. We fiercely protect each other. I would have stayed at the airport waiting for Sonia until three in the morning because I was the one that had everyone's flight and was tracking everyone. Like, you're not gonna get left behind if you are a black woman doing this work. And so again, to Ed Trust, Denise, I mean, I'm seeing so many fans, ASSA, the council, thank you for seeing fit to convene us and, and have this space. What these two know and what I'll share now is long before I became a superintendent, I wrote a dissertation about black women and the superintendency. And so it's affirming and refreshing to be in a place that when I started that journey, there were less than 10 scholarly dissertations written on the concept of a black woman in the superintendency. A tremendous amount of research about teachers and principals and the effects, but we have yet to begin to study in a scholarly way to contribute to academia the actual impact of what it means for a black woman to ascend to the superintendency and then serve. And I could talk to you, like you said, for hours on, is it our training? Is it our sponsorship? Is it mentorship or friendship? 
that I'm just learning tonight. I'm like, this is a whole new word. Or is it our group chat? Or what are the barriers? Is it marriage? Is it childcare? Is it compensation? There are a lot of walls that we have to break down to make this look easy. But because we are not setting spaces and places for research to take place, we aren't even engaging in the conversation. And so it, in a deep, profound way, thank you for setting the stage and table to have this conversation. Thank you for researching and writing about it. And if I had one call, please continue to tell our stories. Though we are 1.4% now, what we also know is research shows that when we leave our seats, we are not replaced by black women. And so when Dr. Santalisis or Dr. Goffney talks about their concerns around literacy or the progress or what we know is capable when a black woman is educating any child, all of that is lost if we are not being super intentional about pipeline, leadership development. How do you ascend to the seat and stay in the seat? Again, I'm the state superintendent in DC, right? Rounding out two years. And at every twist and turn, you know, we, we've just met today, but you, you're going to go into group chat. Sorry in advance. It's a very active group chat. <laughs> but we make it through. But what I can say is from day one, Dr. Goffney and Dr. Santalisis have been there. Best day, worst day. As I'm sitting here tonight, I got a text message like, good evening, superintendent. All the transportation routes are in, right? Because every single night, I don't get to sleep until I know that every single child is home. And they are the ones that when the board meeting goes awry or when council is council or they are helping in real time navigate this space because we don't have books written on this topic. We don't have research published on this topic. Harvard is not producing case studies on the way that Dr. Santalises navigated a governor attack and how we rounded and created community for her to get to her seventh year. But I could list tons of case studies on other topics on how other leaders have navigated their path. And so my call to action, I know I should talk about my system and how great it is and thank you in advance if you send your children to a school in Washington, DC. We've done great work under historic leadership. I think Mayor Bowser is an exceptional mayor, governor and county exec and we should be a state. So let me say all of that work, but the researcher in me or the research practitioner in me would implore more tables to be set on this topic. The individual that raises money for philanthropy would implore that we set more stages and spaces for black women who serve as superintendents to come together, to convene, to learn, to write, to publish, to create a table so that the one, the 1.4 doesn't change if we're not intentional about changing. And I see us having a conversation about black teachers. I see us setting metrics and goals around black principles. I would love to see that level of intentionality and space being held for us to run this race because when black women run and we win, all of our children win. And, you know, I guess I'll close with where I started. I am standing here because of Dr. Goffney, Dr. Santalisis, Lillian Lowry, Monica Golson, Sharon Contreras, Barbara Jenkins, right? Like, I am standing here because I could name some 30 some odd superintendents who check on me. They know my number every single day and I fight like hell to know theirs, but it would mean so much if the community that expects so much of us would be so much more intentional about making sure that we get to the seat, that we sit in the seat, that we navigate it well, and that we are more than just the image of what we see in black women in the superintendency, but that we're being held because we hold a lot in service to all of this country's children. And I, I just, I, I want us to convene next year and be at 7% and then get to 30% and, you know, run the race because the talent is here and, and we're ready to, to, to wear the crown. And congratulations, my sister. Right there. Thank you so much, Christina, for that. Um, but what an evening. I have just been so wowed by everything that this room has brought to us. And I'm just so appreciative of everybody and what they've offered. I heard we're working for impact. 
we can do hard things, that it is about the students, but it's also about the sisterhood. And I am just so proud that we were able to bring you all together for that this evening. Um, events like this really give us some insight into the challenges and opportunities that you face as black women school superintendents. And as advocates, we at the Education Trust are gonna continue to push for increased representation of black women in these critical leadership roles. Our students need it, our educators need it, and our nations need it. Before I go, I just wanna thank our co-hosts, the School Superintendents Association, AASA, as well as our many collaborators that Robin spoke about earlier, but let me give them a shout out again. Education Leaders of Color, the Campaign for Our Shared Future, Center for Black Educator Development, the National Alliance for Black School Educators, Donors Choose, the Council of Great City Schools, thank you, Ray, the New Teacher Project, and the Black Teacher Collaborative. And of course, a very, very big thanks to the Ed Trust staff who are here tonight and who have put so much work into this event in this evening for their tireless work to make this happen. So thank you so much for joining us. And now we'll turn it over to Dr. Trevell. Hello, I'm Dr. Kyla Johnson Trammell, Superintendent of Oakland Unified School District. It is my pleasure to speak with the Education Trust, and I am honored to be one of the Black women superintendents featured in the Leading with Excellence series. As you know, and one of the reasons we're holding this forum, there's simply not enough Black women superintendents. When you're a trailblazer, there's a lot of stress uh, and a lot of expectations at your feet. I'm constantly thinking about, you know, what is my role? I truly believe when you're in the seat of power, it's your responsibility to figure out um, how to make sure that you can provide access to others who will be in the seat after you. Um, and so I think it is important for all of us in these roles to really take that notion of being a trailblazer seriously. Um, to figure out, I do think that there are ways of redefining the role um, so that it really fits who you are as a woman, as a black woman. I don't think that black women in any way, shape or form should feel that we have to copy and lead in similar ways as um, white men. And the more we take courage to do that, I think that's motivating for other black women to see that they can be in the seat as well. Um, but the microaggressions and the challenges and the extra microscope is real. That is the challenge. And one of the reasons I believe every black woman superintendent needs a network um, of black women leaders, which I've been fortunate enough to develop over the years um, to keep you motivated and for you to have support when you're in the role. Finally, what can be done to diversify more women leaders in the role of superintendent and specifically black women? I think one, being real about the equity gaps that exist. Um, oftentimes when women are in the role, black women in particular were paid less. And um, there's a lot more advocacy work that needs to be done to support women with their contracts um, so that they know they deserve to be paid the same for doing the same work. Executive coaching is important for women to be able to have that support when they're in the role. And finally, the importance of sponsorship for those of us who are in the role as black women superintendents to be able to connect um, with other women, black women when they're in the role, um, and that that needs to extend to other folks that are in the role, um, whether they're a black woman or not. Anyone who is in the seat needs to take responsibility um, for really increasing the number of black women that are in these seats. And that means everyone has to be willing to share their social capital, to share relationships, um, and really make sure that black women superintendents have access to the same level of, of networking so that once they get the position, they have the support they need to excel in the role. Thanks so much for having me as a part of this remarkable Leading with Equity series.